share a little bit about um, ANOVA, where we are, um, a little bit about what I'm doing these days, and to give you some insight on what's next for ANOVA. All right. Let me, let me see if I can, oh, okay. So I have a few objectives. They're on the screen. You guys can't see them today, but it's okay. I'm gonna tell you about it. Um, I do have some pictures though. I'm gonna have to figure that out. Uh, <laughs> but I, I just wanted to kind of come again and say, share with you where we are as an organization. If you guys may remember or may recall about three years ago, we got a new CEO, Dr. Stephen Jones who came into the space really, really clear on where he wanted us to go as an organization. ANOVA historically, um, you can put it in a couple of columns, has always been in a space of being in front, kind of being in a place where they had great visibility, great research, great initiatives, community focus, and Sometimes we got into a space of, you know, you gotta, you gotta kind of balance the need to be known with the need to be present, right? So we can have big names, big brands, but we may not be as, you know, grounded as we should be in terms of our organization. So what I'll say is with the entry of Dr. Jones, there's a whole new philosophy of how and why we engage things and why we do what we do and what our full purpose is. First, for full transparency, you know when you are in a really high functioning organization, sometimes people are nice. Sometimes it's the rush of it. It's the, you know, we do really important work. We do, we save lives. We do all of that great stuff, but sometimes it comes with some of that you know, um, uh, egoness, I will say. And I'm always show up who I am. So my organization knows that. So please, please, please understand that. But I will say to you with this transition uh, under Dr. Jones, we have established care imperatives. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I'm gonna also talk about COVID and the recovery and COVID and the recovery, because it's gonna be a cycle, right? It's gonna be with us. It's not something that's going to end. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the care management structure. You wanna know what I'm doing, what I've taken on in the past few years. It looks a little different than what I had before. So I'm gonna share a little bit about that. Then we're gonna get into the real, what really matters. And you know, there's, always new terminology that starts to surface. So there's always this, oh my gosh, this has been new. But social determinants of health, it's always been with us. We've always encountered it. It's the reason why people most times aren't able to transition out of the hospital efficiently because of all of the stuff that they're, they're prioritizing and managing that's outside of their health. They, they want to take care of the basics, right? Food, shelter, am I going to have lights? You want me to get this medicine, but I got to, you know, make sure I have something to eat. So there's a focus on viewing our patients and families um, as they come in as their whole selves, not just treating the ailment or what brought them into the space, but really, really taking the time to get to know our patients and families, what matters to them and what's impacting their ability to carry out the great care plan or treatment plan that we've taken the time to help design for and with them. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's new or what's coming for NOVA which there's a lot of exciting stuff coming um, for the organization. Does that sound okay? Anything you guys want me to do differently? Want me to talk about something else? Just let me know if there's something. All right, cool. So first, first mandate, who we are. We are people-centered. You know, we patients, patients, patients. But we have to care about team members too. 
who care for our patients. So the focus on not only showing up for our patients, which has always been a focus of our organization throughout the time we've existed, now there's a greater concentration on also focusing on our team members. And again, I stand here transparent, transparently, psychological safety is one of our care imperatives. So for an organization to say, listen, we need to treat each other well, and we're going to write it down, and I'm going to hold you accountable to it, and you can raise your hand. If something doesn't feel right, go right with an exchange, with a peer, with a physician, with an executive, we are able to hold to account. So that's the difference maker, right? Even if we started there, if I say to you, what's changing with ANOVA, that's a clear change within our organization. The other is around of course, safety, you know, zero harm. We always strive to be in a place where we do not cause harm. And we're in people work. We have people and people making decisions and people doing extraordinary things. Our goal again is to be able to execute and be able to administer and carry out treatment plans that are safe and that do not ultimately cause harm. Everything from, what do you guys hear about? Preventing falls, errors in terms of surgeries, all of those things that we know are a part of our landscape just because of the business we're in. So our goal on a day-to-day -day basis is to strive for zero harm. And we've created such an environment that every day at one o'clock, our organization's presidents, the CEO, get on a call and say, what's going on today? What happened? A patient fell. Did this happen? We had workplace violence today. We had this today. And everybody feels safe enough to raise their hand and say, this happened today. So that there's cross-organizational learning you know, something happens in one hospital historically, there was not a quick deliverance of information that said, everybody watch for this. If we have a faulty piece of equipment that did this in the OR yesterday at Fair Oaks, who else has that? Have you checked yours? What do we need to do? That's the type of communication that's happening on a daily basis, ultimately, to ensure that we do everything within our power to create an environment first that's safe to raise your hand and say, oh, there was a mistake. And then secondly, to learn from it as an organization and speak to it directly and then action it. Fix it that day. If there is a recliner in a waiting room that someone sat on because of the, the you know how they roll back and you sit on the bottom part? People just sit on the bottom part and they kept falling on the floor. And we were like, well, why do we still have those chairs? Take all of them out and get a different type of chair. So things as simple as that to things that happen in the OR that are adverse or that are even catastrophic. We have to talk about it. It happens. We have to talk about it to mitigate it, to do better, to learn from it, and to not put anyone else in a position of a bad process, a bad piece of equipment, or even a gap in learning or knowledge. All of that's safe in our space today. Um, the other is collaboration of teams, um, best using best evidence. We just don't do things because a physician wants to do it and he's well known and he's prominent. So let's start doing it because we want to attract them. No, does it make sense? Does it make sense for our organization's mission? Does it fit into our care imperatives? Is this who we are? So that's pretty much in terms of our mandate to be high reliable, highly reliable, to add high value and to get stuff out the way, seamless, 
I don't know how hard it is for you to make an adoptive appointment or to be able to access care or even transition. That's the work we're doing. Not perfect, not perfect, but the work is happening. So that's our strategy. That's the space we're in. That's the headspace we're in. That's what keeps me engaged. That's why I'm still here <laughs> because I believe what we're doing, where we're going, who we are. Um, and I've had an extraordinary amount of learning in this space. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't learning. I came in as a social worker. I became a nurse while at the organization and pursued my MBA while at the organization. So I took those avenues because I saw the importance of understanding and it served me really well today. So, so I appreciate the influence the organization has had on my career so far. So, all right. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, so that was our, who we are as a NOVA. So that was the first, the first objective we talked about. You think, is there anything else you wanna know about ANOVA? Covered it pretty good. You can think about it later. You don't have to shout it out now. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, all of them. <laughs> I have, uh, and I'm sorry, maybe I should have shared a little bit of that. I have responsibility for all the care management teams in all five hospitals and the ambulatory care team and the home health portions, relationships, as well as other vendor relationships and the contracting for the ambulances, who would have known that, but, uh, and uh, physician advisors in all of the buildings um, report. I have that reporting relationship. So I have a system role um, so I sit at the old Exxon campus, the ICPH campus, that's where I sit. And I am floating between buildings, going on site, seeing my team members. So you're welcome. Little bit, <laughs> just a little, just a, you know, everybody in a healthcare space needs two of them, three of them to be able to do the work. It's incredible. It's incredible the amount of work that's being done across, across organizations. Um, COVID-19, what, uh, what, 18 months or so. So just gonna tell you a little bit about the journey and somebody keep, make sure I time check. I don't wanna keep you guys up cause I could talk okay. forever. Okay, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> um, COVID-19, ANOVA's response to the pandemic. First of all, we were like, what, what, what is going on? right? This whole March creep up, you know, hearing all this, we were like, what is going on? But started to get ready early. I mean, daily, what's going on? What are you hearing? What's going on? And I know everybody in the country was probably doing the same thing. I can just imagine us trying to figure out what to do. We had to learn and act at the same time. Patients were coming. We were trying to figure it out. Put them on oxygen too early. No, no, no. Don't vent them that early because if you vent them that early, they'll long. It'll be elongated. Let's slow down. Do we use, you know, ECMO, which was one of we were the one of the first organizations to step into that light. So we, as with everyone else in the country, had to learn, care, and act at the same time learn, care, act, protect both our community, our team members, and our patients coming in. You know, who goes in the room? Who doesn't go in the room? What teams go where? Do we look at remote work? Who's appropriate to work remote from a hospital organization? Are you kidding me? Who works remote from a hospital setting? That's You know, so we had to be creative. Remote didn't necessarily mean at home, we kind of defined remote as you're going to work out of the cancer building, call in to the patient's room, or you're going to be outside of these units so that we preserve PPE, 
for those who needed to go into the room and so that we protect our team members as much as we possibly could while we were learning, caring, and acting. We always kept moving. We always kept changing. And it was required. It was a necessity to continue to do that. We utilized the waivers, right? We provided subacute services in the wing of our Nova Loudon Hospital when we started to not have access points for subacute care for COVID patients. So what do you do? Every day that was changing, right? The landscape was changing in terms of our resources. Today, people could take patients. Tomorrow, no. We have to wait. We have a break. We got 14 days, whatever that time frame was defined, but we still had to care for people who were coming in. So the people who were there and ready to go, we had to figure out how do we still care for them, not delay their recovery. So we had to change. We, instead of doing subacute rehab in our LNRC building, which held to be COVID free for the longest time, I think until around September of last year, we didn't want to introduce that in that building. So we said, let's take this wing, let's move our therapist, let's do the service there and assign those beds as sub subacute beds. Then what we started to do every day, we would get on the call, how many we need to transfer, how many we need to transfer, and people went. We cycled patients through, they got their therapies, then they got home versus them being held in an acute care setting because they had nowhere to go. So those are the types of things we had to do and be open to being different in that way, right? Um, the hospital administrators had to understand that we couldn't cover or kind of say, no, we're, we don't wanna do that out here. We had to be uniform in our decisions around what, how do we best serve our patients based on what's going on now. We pulled up IV clinics to do the IV therapies. Once the patient was identified as COVID positive in the ED, we didn't send them upstairs. We sent them out if they could go out. Treat them with the um, monochromial, I know I'm not going to say it right, therapies so that they could have that service, but they weren't in a bed in a hospital where we needed more critical space for patients who required that level of care. So we had to do things that were uncomfortable. We had to shift resources, and then we had to trust. We had to trust our leadership that we are doing the right thing with what we have in this time and space to serve our community as we're adjusting to whatever this is as we're learning. So we did a lot of that. Increased community partnerships, things that were a result of it, and you guys probably felt this as well, limited visitation, no visitation. And then we got to a point where, where we had people dying alone. So we had to say, okay, people dying alone, we gotta allow people to have someone with them if they're in a dying space. So we made adjustments there. We let hospice and we let fan. We limited it as much as we could, but we people were dying alone. Um, and we were trying to figure out how do we serve our community, keep people safe, and allow the dignity of this to still occur. Very difficult. Very difficult to do, but we had to, we had to adjust in terms of that. To date, as of yesterday, we've uh, treated in our hospitals 8,273 COVID positive patients. Of that, we had uh, less than 8% of them died. That's about 575 patients died um, from COVID within our hospitals, all five, all five together. So, so we, we learned a lot, we've adjusted. There's a new normal. We don't think the same. Um, there were many things that we gained from that experience, um, many learnings, and we hope to take them with us as we continue to um, do this work. Um, you know, the disparities in health were evident, very, very evident, and we had to call that out as well. So raised attention to 
what we need to pay attention to as we support our patients and community. So I'll speak, we're still COVID, right? There's no and, but you gotta, we gotta do COVID and. We can't be paralyzed by just focusing on COVID, right? Because it's with us and it's changing. So we just got to be on our heels about what's new with that. So from a recovery space, I say recovery in terms of response. What do we do to reposition ourselves? Our organization, and this is something that's going on in the world, in the media, was one of the first to say, every one of our employees must be vaccinated. Ooh. <laughs> we really going to do that? Yes, we're really going to do that. And here's why. We care about our team members. We care about our community. We care about our patients. The evidence is there. You can challenge it all you want. We can talk nuances about it. We can talk about the probability of an adverse reaction. We can, we can do all that. But ultimately, the evidence that supports our organization's decision, we believe in that and we support it and we're committed to it. Doesn't speak to what others are doing or not doing. It speaks to who ANOVA is and who ANOVA wants to be ready and available to serve. So that's something that uh, September 1st, every team member, even in those newly remote team members, we got some new team members that work only remote now. Hmm, never would have thought it. Even our remote team members are required to get the vaccination. First shot in arm by uh, September 1st, second shot October 1st. If you do not have that and you do not have a waiver for a religious or for a medical reason, um, same as with our flu policy. Um, and those times come around, you have seven administrative days and then you are terminated from our organization. No, if your waiver isn't approved, that's, that's, we're holding to that stance. And again, it's for the greater benefit. Um, again, there's many opinions out in the world today uh, and people choose where they want to work and where they want to be. And we've chosen this path for our organization and our community. So, um, yes. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. So I, I definitely will share with you, we are open to partnerships. Yes, we do have preferred providers. We do, it is not a secret, have a joint venture named Anova Home Health. We also have Anova Home Infusion, but we aren't limiting. Our strategy forward is a huge strategy forward. There's a lot of work for hospital at home and how we can manage and service people in different areas outside of the hospital. We can't meet capacity for all of that work. So we have to lean into partnerships across the board. We're in a place now where we're evaluating all of our partnerships. So we also look at 
where are our gaps and where are our opportunities? So what I will say, I know there's some gaps in terms of vendor fairs and there's probably lost opportunities with getting in front of team members and things of that line, nature. What I would say is we always look for partners who have quality initiatives that align with our quality initiatives, right? Things that we can link into, hook into that will help support caring for our patients in place and not having them be readmitted or and or preventing admission altogether. So my ambulatory care team has probably a place where we can have a conversation. I have a director there, her name is Tanya Kitchmeyer, and she is a resource too that has a team and community, about 30 nurses, social workers that support patients outside of the hospital. So the hospital is not the only inroad. There's hospital as well as ambulatory care space that we get. But, you know, I know it's hard to get in in front of, I know, because I am usually the one people are trying to get in and in front of. And sometimes that's very, very difficult, but we can allow time and space. So as we transition into strategy and move forward and even talk about the goals of the organization, there is time and space and room to, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I think there is a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they call it. They, yeah, and actually, listen, I have, you know, we have patients who COVID, pneumonia, I need high flow oxygen, are in hospital trying to access a community point. One of the barriers is the percentage or the amount of oxygen that patient needs. So if there was a middle ground that could outside of an L tax space, right? Because that's another avenue. But if this person is going to be on this level of oxygen for an extended period of time, you know, is there a space where that person could be cared for in a home environment versus in a facility? So those types of patients with, what do they call it, long haulers that have damage that where they need those levels of support are kind of in that in-between space. But it, is it very small amounts of long-term disability from COVID itself? I don't know what the percentage is. I even, even the reporting of this is why I'm still feeling so bad I think they're still capturing that data. I know they're starting to kind of accumulate information about people's experience and where they are month two, month three, month four. But I don't think we have a summary of data over time that really gives us the percentages of so much statistical information that could be white paper. Does that make sense? I understand the deaths now are about 10% of what they were uh, at the peak. Is that what you're seeing yourself? Did the deaths, number of deaths go down to about 10% in recent numbers? Mm -hmm. Or do you go through very peak? So our numbers are less than that, number one. Nationally, I don't know. There's a 3,200 days in the peak, and now it's about 320, 3.5. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I can't answer that specific question. Right. Yeah. So what Yeah, we struggled. We struggled. We've used all the, I mean, every vendor, Lincare, Roberts, John Hopkins, we use a variety of providers. But during this time, it was who could provide the oxygen and who could store it. We did struggle with that. We ended up doing, um, sending patients home with oxygen and pulse ox 
post oxes, portable post oxes, because we wanted them to monitor and we didn't want them to stay on oxygen longer than they needed to. But we really did struggle with that resource during peak time. We've, we've leveled out. I mean, again, we don't, on average, we are probably in the single digits in our hospitals and numbers where we were peak four or 500 at Fairfax. So we're, we're not in the double digits at this time. Not during peak, but now, of course, you have to meet all the indicators. We do, we do, yes, yes. We've done about a little less than 500,000 vaccinations for the Northern Virginia area. We were the primary vaccination center to service our community. Um, and of course, we're still open and available to do that as patients or individuals um, require it. We're moving to even vaccinating our inpatient patients if we know that they are not. We weren't doing that initially, but we've moved into that space. If there's a patient who hasn't been vaccinated or someone who is in the hospital when the time for their second dose we try to recover that. We just need to know it. So communicating that during transitions is really, really important. Um, what I will say from a care management standpoint, I did share, we have nurses, social workers, CMA support um, in our hospitals. And then we also have the ambulatory team that supports transitions of care. So we have a referral process, high risk, patients who are likely, and high risk could be from a disease state or from a social determinants of health state. And it's important to know that our focus on social determinants of health comes out of the knowledge that 80% of what drives a patient's um, inability to manage their care is not their illness. It is that other stuff. It's even down to zip code being in food deserts. What do you choose to eat is based on what's available to you, right? So we tell people to go home, do this, eat less of this, don't do this, and they don't have access to that. So what, they nod their heads and they keep it moving. They're like, listen, this is what I can afford. This is what I like. You know, we I have that problem. This is what I like, but this is what's down the street and I can get cheap or you know, economically, right? Because I got to balance all these other needs that I have for my family and community. So that's really something that we have to pay attention to. We can't make assumptions. I had a session, we did a work group. I had a session with a pediatrician and she said to me, Pamela, I thought having insurance was the common denominator. So I wouldn't pay attention. I wouldn't even think about, I just think, oh, they have insurance, so they're good, right? I would pay more attention to those who didn't have insurance because I would think that they're the ones who really need help. But there are families out there who are insured who are struggling, right? It may be different, but they still have different priorities and they're going to meet their needs that are basic first before they connect to a treatment plan, especially if it costs them money. We all know that insurance coverage varies. Mm. So, so that the fact that that slot is filled does not indicate that everything's all good and they're able to access everything they need. So again, zip code, um, um, race, uh, you know, behaviors. You know, there is some accountability and ownership of some of the stuff too, like smoking, exercising, all of those things are a part of it as well. And the circumstance they are in may cause their inability to do that. But these are things that are also indicators and they're a focus of ours. I wanna switch gears really quickly. How much time do I have? Let me just make, I wanna make sure. Okay, all right. I'm gonna wrap up really quick with the, what's new department and then we can chat a little bit, okay? Is that okay? Okay, I feel like I've been talking forever. <laughs> Is that okay? All right. So ANOVA, ANOVA, ANOVA. So ANOVA is um, looking forward 
looking at our, um, what we have in terms of our portfolio, we are uh, looking to open two new hospitals. Is one of them right here? <laughs> no, no, it's not. Is that the rumor? Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. We have two two new hospitals on the map or visible today. I don't know. There may be some backroom talk that I don't know about that you got. <laughs> you got you got entry too. You might have some backroom talk. But we have a, a ambulatory center that is actually going Potomac Yards. We're gonna have an ambulatory center in there uh, with mixed housing as well emergency room um, as well as shopping retail. We're going to have a Nova Springfield hospital, brand new hospital, pretty, pretty, has a, well, I won't say that, <laughs> has a Beyonce suite, you know, VIP suite. I was like, I need to design that. But anyway, I guess that's what they call these suites for the, um, just something fun with that. Um, so we have a Springfield hospital and a Nova Alexandria is actually the landmark campus space. So a new Anova Alexandria hospital with uh, medical centers on, on that campus of where Landmark Mall is. So those are, we're going, done, we're on the roadmap, we're building the rooms, we're looking at the furniture, we're doing all of that for the, so those are things that are coming um, in the in the portfolio of ANOVA. So we'll, we're looking forward to being able to service and specialize our services, all private rooms, you know, even, you know, to the point where you're like with COVID, now even our designs were impacted by COVID because we started out one way and it was like, oh, well, wait a minute. Should the sink be outside the room or the sink inside the room? Do the doors open without you touching them and you stand up, you walk? So all it, do we teleport in? I'm kidding. But, you know, having some way to go into the room and engage the patient without physically going in. That's what we're doing in terms of that. So, yes. Um, it's where the the... It's where the, and I can show, I have pictures of kind of where it is. It's where the health flex is, the whole, yeah, we're taking that whole, that land we purchased. Yes, so it's on the campus where the health flex is today. Yes. I have a question. What's the current visiting privileges like now? Well, uh, we do have, we have let uh, vendors come in through rep trucks. You just have to register. So you can come in and see a patient. We have relaxed some of our visiting hours, but as you know, it's day to day, touch and go right now. So we have opened up some visitation, but that we're monitoring that every day. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you know what? I haven't even, that's a great question. I haven't even asked that question or gotten a def definition of these are the times people can come in. But that's a great question. Hmm, I'll have to ask. I don't know. Hmm. Yes. Sure. <laughs> sure. You want me to just say it out loud? <laughs> Um, well, I'm Pamela.Andrews at Anova.org. I think I do have some cards with me. So um, I, I don't know how many, but I'll definitely give out what I have. But the, or Abigail. So, so here's what I like. Here's what I've started doing. I like for us to do things as a system. I, you know, because of time and space and how we have to get together, if we want to do a Zoom meeting or something along those lines to do a service introduction or a connection thing, I like to do it as a system. And sometimes what I'll do because of varying times, I'll be like, let's set up two or three sessions. And have you come and then the different team members that were able to come come 
so that I don't pull all of my team members off the floor at one time and that there is good, uh, you know, engagement. Because if, you, if, they, if I have five buildings able to get on a Zoom and have different team members, that's, that better serves us as a system and they can hear things at the same time. So that's what I've been doing lately for any requests to connect with those team members. Yep. Abigail, she's my admin. <laughs> she's my entry point. <laughs> Abigail.barnes at Anova. That, yes. Yes. So there's definitely an avenue to reshare and newly share. We have had, I don't know if you guys are experiencing this in your buildings, but we've had a lot of people deciding not to do healthcare, being healthcare buildings anymore. Da, da, da. So we have new, a lot of new team members um, and are continuing to recruit. So there is knowledge gap of what's available in community. And we do have to get on a normal cadence of sharing what's in community. So those programs that help relieve, now listen, I got a huge length of stay uh, goal to accomplish by the end of the year. So I need partners everywhere. So any programs that help support safe, efficient transitions is what we're looking to be able to provide for our patients and families. And honestly, we sometimes are positioned to be the guarantor of some of those things. So we, we build relationships across community. There are things that are available that make sense that can help us transition a patient more efficiently. We will look to enter those relationships. Um, Pat Davis is my um, contracting, my systems person who takes care, who, who is my not, she has, she's the person to know about all your programs because she's the person that helps with, we look at a, a, when we have challenges to transitions or barriers, whether they're social, financial, clinical ones are more difficult, okay, because there's not something out there that can support them. But when we have those social and financial challenges, social may mean that we have to secure guardianship, something along those lines. There's no supportive resource in community. We become the, we become the guardian, not we as ANOVA, but we manage the process for community guardian for that person. And then we help support the transitions. So she is the architect of that work for our system. Certainly as Pamela. Yeah, I heard she's coming to speak for uh, acute rehab. She also is the director of acute rehab, right. too. Yeah, so We're she's excited. You're excited. Yeah. I was like, she didn't tell me she was coming to speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she didn't tell me. I learned it outside. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. It's good for us to get out um, while we can. And I'm, this is because I'm older um, than most, but I will tell you that it's the, um, it's, there's just like a cycle because you're going back to triage like we did years ago. You're going back to holistic medicine like we did years ago. So, you know, the history of, of healthcare just keeps cycling back. And it's wonderful that we keep trying and new things that we're smart enough to recognize what worked in the past may work in the future. And we just have to 
tune it up a little bit, right? But um, everything that you said, you know, they put new uh, words, they attach new labels, but basically it's triaging, getting them out if they're safe to discharge, setting up a, a, a viable uh, goals of care, and then going from there, right? So it's nice that, uh, you know, you guys all know the new terminology, that there's old terminology that attaches those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's us. I wanted to talk to you guys. I think I met my object. I told you about ANOVA, where we are. We talked about a, a little bit about ambulatory care management, all of that. Talked about COVID, couldn't walk in here without talking about that. And we talked about what's coming in terms of the organization. There's so much. There's so many things we, you know, campaigns to talk about what matters most, let's focus on people focus on teaming and relationships. There's just so many moving parts um, in our world. And, you know, we can't do this work independently. ANOVA does not master or own everything. We have to have partners, clear partners with aligned, uh, you know, quality initiatives, aligned missions, visions, and values, treating people respectfully. We have to, we don't live on an island. Sometimes it feels like we think we do, you know, we're ANOVA, okay. Just like all the other, you know, <laughs> okay. But ANOVA can't stand alone. And we know that, we know that. Our community physicians, very important. We have, of course, the physician enterprise that is ANOVA employed. And we have community physicians that are embedded in our hospitals because we can't do this without them. Um, so I think what's different about us is that recognition and that voicing of that out loud. So I'm happy to still be here. I'm happy to see what else is coming. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I have no idea about that. So, so. <laughs> I have no idea about that. But uh, yeah, I'm here for it. Um, as long as they'll have me. <laughs> I'm here for it. So thank you guys. Uh, I it was great to get back out here and talk to you. It was so good. Great. Thank you. Great.